Welcome to the Richie Flow Nutrition Podcast. My name is Cameron Borg. On this episode, I had the pleasure of speaking with Sally Norton. Sally Norton is an educator, speaker, and health consultant who specializes in the impact of oxalates in the human diet. Sally has a bachelor's degree in nutritional science from Cornell University and her master's degree in public health from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Sally's own health journey led her to the realization that many foods that are considered to be among the healthiest actually contain a metabolic toxin that even in modest amounts can cause illness and disease. Oxalates are compounds made by plants for various purposes including calcium homeostasis, structural integrity, and to ward off insects. This seemingly innocuous compound binds with minerals, particularly calcium, and creates oxalate crystals, known to most as kidney stones. Oxalates inhibit energy metabolism and impede normal cellular functioning when consumed in amounts that exceed the body's capacity to detoxify it. Unfortunately, in today's diet culture world of spinach, sweet potato, kale, chard, cacao, and raspberries, many people who think they're doing the best thing for their health are slowly but surely poisoning themselves with oxalates. This is a discussion I feel very lucky to have had as I think it's a serious issue that needs more attention, particularly as diet choices are becoming more polarizing. With all that being said, I hope you enjoy our conversation. Thank you so much for taking some time to speak with me, Sally. I've really been looking forward to this. Well, I am too. Thank you. We're going to have fun. Yeah. So um, how did you become aware of this oxalate um, issue to begin with? Yeah, well, I was educated to not be aware of it because it's very briefly covered in nutrition school. And, you know, I was quite aware that it was important for people with kidney stones. And that was the extent of it. It's like bad for your kidneys. Um, So I had no idea, A, that it could cause other problems and B, really where it was in my diet. So, you know, my whole life I've been eating foods completely out of ignorance that are high in a toxin that's been causing a lot of problems for me personally. And it turns out it's a problem for a lot of people. And I didn't really have a clue despite my profession and my connections and with all the holistic healers and the conventional medical world, none of us know about this. So yeah, it was uh, the luck of having the internet. I mean, thanks to the internet. (laughs) My husband found the Volver Pain Foundation on my behalf in 2009. And that didn't completely educate me all the way because I didn't understand what I've come to understand since then when I've done, since done my research. But it did make me willing to become more aware of the oxalate I'm eating. So they helped teach me about where oxalate was in my diet. And a few years later, it became more and more obvious because I I attempted to do the diet and didn't necessarily notice miraculous benefits from it other than something that I think would have happened anyway. And that is that the crotch pain I was having went away. That's what the, the Volver Pain Foundation has been helping people for over 30 years who have chronic pelvic problems, particularly um, genital pain with women in particular, but both men and women have this genital pain problem and other forms of pelvic problems. And they've been teaching that oxalates in the diet are part of the issue. And that if you take them out of your diet, you can get a fair amount of relief from this problem. And I, that was news to me. And they were also teaching this idea of a connective tissue disorder, which described me really well. So I was intrigued and desperate. I didn't have any other answers anymore. I'd done everything I know to do, but I didn't understand really how this works. So it took three more years of now being aware when I'm eating oxalates to finally recognize that the oxalates I've been eating has been connected to my longstanding arthritis that started when I was 12, that was terrible in my 20s. Um, And that forced me like, "Ah, that was shocking to me. Hello, you mean my diet, my healthy food, the foods that I chose to support good health with the reason I had all this arthritis and now it's coming back because I'd added kiwi and some celery back in my diet and was doing this every single day to try to get over chronic constipation that I was in other kinds of gut issues that I was associating with my sleep disorder because I'd gotten to the point where I couldn't work anymore. And it turned out that after all the medical testing, I was sent to the sleep lab and my brain was waking up 29 times every hour all night long. Okay, so I get two minutes of sleep at a time. (laughs) That's not sleep. (laughs) 
this was ending my life, right? I was completely becoming useless and unable to do much of anything. So I was desperately pursuing ideas to help with the gut health, to try to help the toxicity that was wrecking my brain, not knowing that all along that it was the oxalate. So I was using, adding back in kiwi to try to heal the gut because it's supposed to help with constipation. It turns out the reason it helps with constipation is because it's full of rapide crystals and other forms of oxalate that are gut irritant and you can irritate your gut hard enough with kiwi to blow you out a little better and keep the constipation from being um, a stuck problem. But even that wasn't working that well. But what it did do for me was reveal a reemergence of my arthritis and was causing me to become more and more stiff. All of my connective tissues and fascias were were becoming more stiff, which is obvious in my yoga class, because I had a practice of three or four times a week going to a hot Bikram yoga class where the routine is identical. They keep the humidity 40%. The temperature is 105 degrees and the, the patter from the teacher is identical. Everything is the same except you. It's a beautiful way to have a diagnostic dipstick in your body, in your life, to do something like that. That's so routine that the only element that changes is you. And I was becoming worse and worse and worse at range of motion and all everything while I was doing this Kiwi thing to try to help my constipation to fix my brain and sleep disorder. And what all I got out of it was that stiffness and now more arthritis. And so as I'm laying in bed being in pain again and thinking, why? And I was like, the Kiwi, the oxalate, that's it my arthritis. So begrudgingly, I get serious and get back off because I had gradually added sweet potatoes back to my diet, was doing a little bit of celery juicing and having a couple kiwi every day. So I'm like, oh crap, I have to do this stupid diet for my arthritis when I'm trying to fix my sleep problem. Like I really wasn't into it. <laughs> okay. So, you know, I thought I had 10 problems, you know, arthritis, thyroid problems, autoimmune problems, sleep disorder, gut problems. They were all different. And so I thought, oh, how unfair for me have to work on 15 problems at once and have to do this arthritis diet and pain diet when I want to fix my sleep. That was my priority. So I went on the diet and lo and behold, in 10 days, I could tell I'm sleeping. I mean, I couldn't even, I didn't even know I wasn't sleeping because I'm so exhausted all the time and I'm out to lunch but what was cluing me in is the fact whether I was able to focus enough to read. <clears throat> and the, the best source of that information for me was getting the mail, bringing in the mail from the mailbox and looking at it. Would my brain engage with it and be able to comp comp you know, contemplate what the heck is in the mail? Or would I set that down and go, oh, I'll deal with that later? Because the, oh, I'll deal with it later was how I was dealing with most reading tasks, especially like the mail. And this, Suddenly I was engaging in life and able to read because <laughs> I was yeah. sleeping because I stopped eating sweet potatoes and kiwi and chard. Mm. I mean, I already given up chard because I had Joanne had taught me. Joanne is the founder of the Volver Pain Foundation and she's the grandmother. She's really gets the credit for bringing forth what it turns out is old science. And I don't think she realized how old the science was. They were innovating on their own. It was a modern rediscovery of something that we had rediscovered multiple times in the past. I think it's fascinating there how you outline that there were so many different sort of disparate things connected to this one issue. And I'd love to get back to that a little bit later on, um, just regarding about how um, <laughs> oxalate acts as a sort of a general metabolic toxin. But um, what is oxalate uh, at, a, at a foundational level and where is it found in in the diet generally oxalate is often said oxalates plural because it's a set of natural toxins in many common and popular foods that as i say can lead to increasing health problems over time and those common and popular foods are getting more and more common and popular things like potatoes we've really elevated potatoes over the last 400 years but particularly since we invented the french fry and the potato chip and now all other kinds of things tater tots and you know hash browns it's like they're everywhere and nowadays people are eating out a lot 
and they're offered either chips or fries with that, and they're offered baked or fries with dinner. They're very cheap and easy for restaurants to to use and make sure they're keeping people happy and making money at the same time, which is the magic for staying in business as a restaurant. But it does mean that people don't even realize how much more potatoes we're eating. And now sweet potatoes are the healthy version. Everyone knows potatoes aren't that great for you, especially when they're fried in nasty oils. And it turns out frying potatoes in oil seals in the soluble oxalate, which is the smaller dissolvable molecule that most easily gets into our bloodstream versus the bigger crystals. Like in the kiwi has these toothpick crystal shapes because oxalate attaches to minerals like calcium in particular and creates calcium oxalate crystals, which is fundamentally what a kidney stone is made of. And so there's the foods that are delivering these foods that we start as a newborn who's graduating from breast milk to solid foods is being given things like sweet potatoes. And now all of us think sweet potatoes are better than white potatoes. So I was eating them every day because I was no longer tolerating beans or wheat. And so I I wanted to start. So I was using it as my staple food. Big mistake. And then there's beets are so gross. They're supposed to be great for your vascular system, right? (laughs) Beets are really high in oxalate. Used to make beet kvass and all this stuff. And then there's the beet greens, which is basically Swiss chard. Chard and beet greens are dark leafy greens right up there with spinach. And spinach is sort of the poster child of a high oxalate food. It's the one we've known for a very long time is high oxalate. And the very first food that was clearly dubbed as a problem food for humans was rhubarb. And I grew up on rhubarb and it has been in the past very common. It's kind of coming back. It's getting a little health glow now and you can buy rhubarb juice and rhubarb this. And so it's back in fashion. There's the blackberries, there's the kiwi, there's the star fruit, but the bran in grains is high in oxalate. And, and so the whole grain wheat and the brands tend to be high in oxalate. That's all supposed to be so good for your microbiome and all that. People <laughs> are eating more and have been for a long time. I mean, bran has been elevated since the early 1800s when this guy named Graham got into it and was teaching people, oh, you can just live on brand. (laughs) So it's had this health glow for a while. And and then we we keep redoing these same health themes over and over again. So we're repeating now what we were doing in the 70s. Everybody should go plant-based. And so in the vegetable department, you get in trouble. In the grain department, you get in trouble. The beans are high in oxalate. Black beans, which are popular in burritos and white beans, which are the kind of classic bean where... Like the Boston baked bean in the U.S. is very big. And then if you go gluten-free, which everyone seems to be doing, you're going to add in teff, quinoa, and buckwheat, and arrowroot, and these things that are very high in oxalate, and worst of all, almond flour. So nuts, especially almonds, cashews, and peanuts, are really high in oxalate. They're very bioavailable, meaning a lot of it can get into your bloodstream. And they have also been elevated into this like, oh, healthy fats, things like this. So yeah. So what did I leave out? (laughs) Seeds, chia seeds. (laughs) Yeah. The the from what I understand, it's basically any part of the plant that needs that needs protecting and needs just needs to store um calcium in in some way, shape, or form. Um, these are the these are the parts of the plants that um, cal- that concentrate the oxalate the most. So, um, when you, when you eat it, it goes into your, your bloodstream, I presume. And then from there, how is it causing all of these different effects throughout the body? Yeah. And the amount that gets into the bloodstream depends on the health of your gut, mm. right? So if you have an inflamed gut, because it's floating between the cells and the tight junctions are these protein molecules that live in the membranes that hook the cells together. So the lining of the gut, each cell is hooking together with this Velcro attachment with each other, which are these sort of claws of protein hooking. And well, when you have gut inflammation, those tight junction proteins are not working well because they require their structure to be correct. And the structure requires the right pH. And when you've got a lot of inflammation, you're more acidic and other changes happen to cells. And so the protein shapes are deranged. The cell membranes are deranged. And so the the space that lets water flow between the cells 
is much wider. So you don't even need a really high, high, high oxalate diet to be oxalate poisoned. So number one, what gets into your bloodstream partially depends on the health of your gut. It also depends on whether you have zero calcium in your diet or not, because calcium does help to hold a little bit of it back in the digestive tract and prevent some of it from absorption. Yeah. And so when you go on a dairy-free diet to fix your autoimmune problem, you're increasing the amount of oxalate that gets in there. So now it's in the bloodstream, right? It's left the gut, the soluble oxalates floating around in the bloodstream. It has immediate effects on the vascular cells that create the you know capillaries and veins and arteries but the other cells that are there are your blood cells your red blood cells and your immune cells it turns out that within 40 minutes of taking one spinach smoothie researchers have demonstrated that in many or most of us you see just in 40 minutes now that 40 minutes isn't very long because food hits your mouth and doesn't leave your body for 24 hours so you have a, a lot more time for more absorption to happen. 40 minutes, you've just left the stomach, basically. And you've already elevated the amount of oxalate, so you've damaged those circulating immune cells, and they're now in inflammatory distress. So you turn kind of unprofessional immune cells that have just left the house, they've left college, they're ready to go start their profession somewhere in your body. They're now sick and damage and putting out cytokines that tells the whole body, hey, help me, help me. We're in problem. There's a problem here. You know, and so they're creating inflammation, all subclinical. You don't necessarily have any symptoms from this whatsoever. But right away after a meal, you've got immune system distress and damage. And now those immune cells are less able to grow up and become the fighters they're meant to be to manage bacteria in the body and other infectious agents. So the ability now to handle infections is immediately compromised right after you have a spinach smoothie, which is remarkable. The other thing it can do is if it gets into the blood, red blood cells, and apparently a lot of the oxalate that's in our blood, which never gets measured well, is living in red blood cells. So it easily penetrates the red blood cells and tends to chelate or grab magnesium. Well, magnesium is needed for the mitochondria to work. And the mitochondria now, they are, magnesium, and it also, it not only blocks the magnesium, but it's also hooking on to the enzyme in the last step of glycolysis. Now, red blood cells are really dependent on glycolysis because that creates its energy. It doesn't have mitochondria. So it can't go on to the electron transport chain part and get more energy out of it. But you're blocking it right there at the beginning of energy extraction from glucose in cells. So this is energy metabolism in cells breaking. And now the cell, the red blood cell is deficient in ATP energy. And that breaks the pumps that keeps the fluid balance in the cell. So there's a sodium pump in the cell membrane trying to kick sodium out of the cell so that it can keep the right amount of fluid in the cell. When there's low ATP because there's oxalate in the cell, you break that pump and now sodium is stuck in the cell and fluid comes into the cell and explodes it. So you get this broken red blood cells. They, they kind of explode from water filling them up. Okay, you think of a, a water balloon you've overfilled and poof, that's what happens to the red blood cells. So we haven't done much so far. We've just absorbed a little oxalate. We've already affecting the vascular cells, the immune cells, and the red blood cells, which deliver oxygen and <laughs> help feed your body. Like this is not good to be deficient in oxygen and you end up losing iron. You can create um, anemia in the process of that. So then the, the oxalate goes to the liver. That's the next stop, right? Okay, it goes into the, what we call hepatic circulation. Then the liver immediately cleans and, and manages the everything that's coming in from your digestive tract. So now your liver cells are being completely flooded with oxalate, these open sinusoid areas, they just get saturated with the oxalate. The liver doesn't metabolize the oxalate. It doesn't take it out. It doesn't remove it, even though it's a toxin. It's a toxin that the liver does not remove. The liver actually makes oxalate. So now leaving the liver is blood full of oxalate from your food and oxalate from your liver. And that high level of oxalate that came in increased inflammation in liver and that inflamed, inflamed liver produces more oxalate. So now this moves on up the um, inferior vena cava right to the heart because that's the next stop for the blood. And then the, that's blood is sent to the lungs 
for oxygen, and then it comes back to the heart and is pumped out. So all those tissues, your vascular system and your hepatic circulation, your liver, your heart, and your lungs are all getting exposed to 100% of what you absorb, except what gets left behind in those tissues, a little bit maybe sticking around, which creates chronic problems. And th this is the beginning of just the acute effects. Then there's this chronic problem that can create a systematic poisoning in the body. And those effects on the body are partially reversible when we change our diet, if we change our diet soon enough. But the immune effects are worse than the acute effects after you eat it. It creates oxalate, oxalate creates inflammatory damages to the whole immune system itself that can create a progressive, long-standing chronic inflammation. And that issue can be hard to really fully control and reverse. Yeah. So it seems to me you're talking about oxalate just generally damaging energy metabolism, which can cause any number of issues down the line, whether it's, you know, joint pain to, like you said, damage to the red blood cells themselves. So it's like we're in this situation where we, you know, as a population, we've never had guts that are more damaged than we have right now. And we've got a diet culture that sort of deifies these foods that probably wouldn't have been eaten in great amounts in, in, in our evolutionary past. And these two things coming together has made a perfect storm, uh, so to speak, uh, leading to uh, some kind of oxalate toxicity that is really flying under the radar at the moment. I'm sure with a lot of people um, struggling with a diverse set of issues that uh, not being connected back to their diet because all of these foods are seen as perfectly healthy. It's it's very hard to see your best friend is actually not. <laughs> yeah. It's very hard for us to see basic cultural pillars in our lives, day-to-day -day pillars, things that our parents brought us up on, all our friends do, everybody on the internet's doing. It's not natural for a human to walk away from its culture. And, and think a new thought. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I've heard quite a bit about um, the gut bacteria playing a role in breaking down um, the oxalate and perhaps that's playing a role, you know, our, um, our diverse, our, the diversity of our guts is not what it used to be. That's for sure. Um, I've heard you speak a little bit about the um, potential promise in using oxalobacter um, bacteria, basically supplementing it to help break down. Um, you know, I think I know your thoughts on this, but uh, maybe, maybe you've changed your mind since the last time you spoke about it. So what do you see the future for supplementing oxalobacter um, to help with this, to break down oxalate in the gut? Well, there's lots of different issues there. There's the there's the can we repopulate the gut and people are working on this because what you need to have a set of oxalate degrading bacteria colonize and survive in the gut is a whole ecosystem mm -hmm. and a redundancy because different dietary patterns will promote or dispromote certain bacterial types. And so you need hundreds and hundreds and maybe thousands and thousands of different bacteria coming together as a ecosystem in order to maintain some colonization of the various bacteria that degrade oxalate. And people are working on that because the they've spent 30 years trying to develop an oxalobacter specific supplement and it doesn't work. Like yeah. lots of money has been wasted and lost in investors and in different companies over the years trying to get this holy grail of this degrading bacteria. But there's many others that do some degree of this. High oxalate diet is actually bad for these bacteria. <laughs> they can also get sick from too much oxalate because it is right. pretty toxic. It's a tough job to have to eat a toxin for life. You know, with a role I'd want to come back as <laughs> oxalobacter or anybody like that. But the bigger issue in my view is the misunderstanding that having these bacteria is saving us from this toxin. Mm. And that's mm. because you're absorbing oxalate beginning in the stomach and maybe even in the mouth. You're being affected by oxalate crystals. You can degrade your teeth and your oral health just chewing on oxalate. You're, you're setting your immune cells within 40 minutes. 
but these bacteria don't live in the stomach, not to any, your stomach is not a place for bacteria. That's why it has the 2.0 pH to eliminate bacteria. It's relatively sterile. It's the colon is the place for bacterial action. That's a long trip, many, many hours. You get at least 10, 12, maybe 20 hours before you get to the colon with as food. Most of the oxalate that comes into the body is coming into the body within the first four or five hours, but there's about a 10, maybe a 12 hour period where oxalate levels keep increasing after a meal. But literally it's those first hour or so after a meal where you're really starting to get into trouble. That The bacteria only allows you to really excrete it after you've absorbed it. But why would you want to absorb something that's messing with your immune cells and your vascular system? Why would you want it to come in at all? So I think it's a red herring kind of thing, distraction. Oh, you can eat whatever you want. We're going to save you with our next product. Mm. Do you think, um, you know, you write in the book about sorrel and a few sad stories about um, people uh, unfortunately, uh, succumbing to the high oxalate levels in sorrel from sorrel soup. Um, and you know, spinach is probably right up there as the most densely, um, you know, the, the food with the most amount of oxalates in it. Do you think this is a situation where perhaps cultivars have just sort of got it wrong? And, you know, this is not, a food that should be, you know, consumed in any, um, you know, sorrel sort of used as a culinary herb these days, you know, maybe like a few leaves on top of a very expensive meal. Do you think that's the way that spinach should have gone? <laughs> yeah, because, you know, uh, botanists and agricultural chemists or, you know, uh, ag people, PhDs in agricultural science have been trying to rebreed spinach mm. to see if they can get a lower oxalate version and it's not working. And we have old science that demonstrates that spinach is unfit for humans really because it causes so much calcium loss in the body. We don't, we still, it's shocking to me that here we are 2023 nutrition has been thinking about bioavailability because of fiber and other things that interfere with absorption of nutrients for 60 years. And we haven't advanced at all in that area. Mm. That to me is worth thinking about. Why are we not thinking bioavailability? What we're still saying is in a lab, we can extract X amount of calcium from spinach. And so people on the internet like to claim that spinach is high in calcium. When in fact, the science is very clear that spinach is completely devoid of nutritional calcium. The calcium that's there is essentially calcium oxalate. In plants generally, most of the calcium in plants, 90% of calcium in, in plants as a general biological concept is tied up as oxalate, period. And that's not nutritive, that's toxic. Not the same thing as the calcium that you're claiming on the internet, oh, spinach is high in calcium. This is completely disingenuous and lacking any, any real thought. And that's too bad because we have enough science to demonstrate this is not functional food. And sorrel is right up there with spinach, Swiss chard, red beet greens, and red Swiss chard is worse even than those. And the only thing worse than that is probably rhubarb. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing a trend these days away from more plant-based eating. Uh, at least I've seen a little bit more of a trend towards, uh, you know, uh, prioritizing animal products. Um, and people seem to do quite well on them, at least for a, you know, a short to medium uh, period of time. Do you think that the um, lack of oxalate in animal foods is playing at least a, an important role in why people tend to feel better when they reduce the amount of plant foods that they're eating? Most definitely. There's many different compounds in plants that we don't understand well. And the ones we do know that are toxic, there's maybe 20 of them are really aware are quite toxic. Oxalate is the worst one because there's no way to get around it. You can't really boil it out very well and soak it out. And like you can with phytates and other plant compounds yeah. that are problematic that people are benefiting from reducing in their diet. But there's no question in my mind that the greatest therapeutic benefit of an animal foods only diet is that you've eliminated oxalate and 
other things that really are bothering the gut now. We have gastrointestinal inflammation as sort of normal and eating a lot of bran and random plant chemicals is, is hard on the gut. Mm. So if you're someone like me who went through quite a long period of time where they were eating all of the foods that you write about in the book, um, how long does it take on a relatively low oxalate diet for the accumulation to sort of dissipate and, and, you know, for you to sort of get back to a baseline level? Yeah, it'd be nice if we could really do science on this and define mm. our population base and how heavily exposed they are with oxalate if we knew how much the body burden, because the big issue is that it gets hung up in tissues. It, it collects in areas in the body where you've had inflammation, infection, injury of any kind, even little surgical, any injury, and where those tissues are trying to regenerate. Those are all areas that oxalate sticks and hangs out. So because we were all growing up on chocolate cake since we turned one and potatoes and peanut butter and whole wheat toast and all of that, we, we all to some degree have a bit of this junk in our body, but yeah. some of us it's worse than others. And where it ends up is how much is in your bone marrow, bones, shoulder, neck, spine, eyeballs, kidneys, teeth, jaw, you know, is idiosyncratic. And it's really interesting because the way we know this is because there's a genetic form of the disease where the liver has um, problems in its own metabolism and is overproducing oxalate to a large degree. And they end up dying very young. The ones that get diagnosed as infants don't make it to their second birthday because oxalate kills them. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, in that population, some people don't express much of the disease until they get into their 50s. So even how how that shows up is very different. And then each of these cases, what kind of problems they get from it are completely unique. Some of them fall apart where their bones have total osteoporosis and they're all weak and frail and they're so broken, they're like a blob in a wheelchair the last several years of their life until they die. Other people get hardly any bone problems. Some of them just their teeth fall out eye problems, almost all of them with have pain syndromes, fibromyalgia, arthritis, that kind of thing. So it might be, I think really getting back to normal is to me, the really biggest problem with this is that the tissue injury that the oxalic acid and the crystals that are formed in the tissues create more possibilities for that accumulation problem, which creates pollution of nanocrystals and particulate matter forming in situ right there in your eyeball, right there in your tooth. It's it's not like asbestosis where you breathe in the particulate matter that causes the inflammation in your lungs. You're getting particulate matter forming anywhere in tissues. So that leads to autoimmune, they call autoimmune, but just immune derangements. The immune system is in trouble with all this pollution and fibrosis, which is the scar tissue development in these areas. And these crystals can be sitting in a knot of fibrosis and tissues that are having trouble with self-maintenance and having these energy problems. So the, the energy problems it creates in the cells makes it hard for them to properly reproduce, which increases the, the progression of the scar tissue that's formed by the body's temporary way to hold you together until you can make new cells, which you have trouble, make continuous trouble dealing with that scar tissue, dealing with the poor maintenance in the tissues that starts to happen over time, which in, in continues to raise inflammation levels in the body. So it's this inflammation system damage, immune system damage, that creates this long-standing silent inflammation that's slowly building up and you get all kinds of problems. So depending on how much of that is going on, depending on how much your immune system is now overworked and confused, will it, will impact the course of the recovery. But in the people I work with are pretty darn sick with oxalate. Mm. And many of them right away when they start the diet, they can see the body's attempt to expel the stuff. And some people don't get into that expelling, obvious we call it, you know, clearing illness or dumping or the system is happily trying to push this stuff out. Sometimes that starts at a different time. This can be right away. It can be delayed by weeks, months, years, as much as three or six years. But my experience is the arc of recovery is easily a 10-year arc. 
And at year three, you're going to feel pretty terrible because you're doing this deeper cleanup in your bone marrow or wherever in tissues that can be pretty tough. Um, so it, it depends really to me how heavily contaminated the body is, how much heft you still have metabolically and how much your immune system has gotten overworked and confused because you're going to maintain, I think, some of this immune system confusion for, for a while. Mm. And it's fascinating. You write in the book that um, some of the symptoms of, you know, this clearance can be, you know, little feeling like you've got like little shards of glass coming out of your skin, gritty snot, um, you know, ch chalky sort of stool as it, as it just tries to come out of your body any way that it, that it can. It's quite, I, I hadn't really heard of anything like that before until I read that in the book. I hadn't heard of it inside working with people. <laughs> yeah. I, I, when I realized this, I was like, hey, wait a minute. I have all these friends in integrative medicine and medicine. No one's been able to help me over the years. I have a degree from Cornell. I couldn't figure this out. I was like, how is anyone ever going to find out if they're in my situation where their sweet potato habit is ruining their life? So I started teaching it, you know, for free and then people wanted me to help them personally. And so I had to sort of develop this consultation business. So I've been working with people now for quite a while. And um, what they started, wait, my fingers are peeling. There's grit coming out of my fingernail beds and there's crystals coming on my skin. I'm like, what? At the beginning, I'm like, I had no idea because none of that, none of that obvious stuff was happening with me. I was always the cloudy urine gal. Cloudy urine is often a sign that you're forming a lot of oxalate crystals in the urine. And with that, you get not just the crystals, which bounce light and make the urine look kind of whitish and cloudy. You can't see through it. Um, it also, you're stripping off cells a lot when that's, when the body's flushing out oxalate, the kidneys will strip off cells, the bladder strips off cells. So it adds to the cloudiness. So it's really cloudy is probably when there's a lot of cells in there too. But I was like, Miss Cloudy Urine, great kidneys who've been willing to pee out cloudy urine for 50 something years. You know, <laughs> it's like a lot of us have really good kidneys and put up with this. And that's another reason why we don't know about it because medical science thinks kidney stones, that's the only problem with oxalate, just don't eat spinach and you're okay. Well, a lot of us are very polluted with oxalate and it has not caused the kidney stone and still hasn't despite menopause and everything else, because women are slightly protected by higher estrogen levels, but after menopause, they're more prone to kidney stones like men are. Mm. But so, yeah, this stuff about the body just, I'm still stunned by it. People snow their skin, like they feel like they're shedding snow off their skin, massive amounts. They can actually brush off their sheets in the morning yeah. for years and years and years. Other people get these boils and things. Other people frank visible crystals pushing out of their skin uh in the the urine the stools the there's transporters in the colon this is where that oxalobacter and these oxalate degrading bacteria come in because the transporters in the colon when there's kidney stress going on and acidity in the body they turn on and they start excreting oxalate feeding those bacteria and those bacteria like to tell the colon give me some oxalate so there's a real role for those bacteria because they're encouraging the body to excrete oxalate. And we don't fully know how they do it because they can do it even without the transporters. There's been no mice knockout studies where you take away the transporters and cells. And if you have the bacteria, you can still excrete it. So the, some people get gritty stools, but often they'll get diarrhea, constipation, um, poor activity of the rectum and all this sort of thing harder on the teeth. The mm. saliva glands naturally concentrate oxalate levels in the blood. So when tissues are releasing oxalate back into the bloodstream, more tartar can form on the teeth. Uh, mucus, the lungs and the mucous membranes will pr produce more mucus to get rid of, flush this stuff out. So you'll get more mucus forming as well. It's really, none of that is in our education. We're, mm. we're all just discovering this from reality. And it turns out that reality is probably important, even though our textbooks, which are just people copying each other's ideas down and regurgitating them to the next generation, we we think textbooks matter more than reality now. Mm. We are of an upside down sense of what's true and what isn't. So 
it's hard for us to see reality when it doesn't match what we've been taught. And we hang on to our teachings when rather than honor reality as an entree point into truth. Mm. Yeah, look, I, had a, I had a similar experience to you. I, I was, after reading your book uh, and, and starting to take on a few things that you had, that you had suggested, uh, my urine was, was so white, so milky white. I, I was worried that there was something wrong with me. <laughs> Um, but yeah, and, uh, if, if I, if I ate chocolate, it would get milkier, milkier, milkier. And if I stayed away, it would, it would gradually, um, clear out. So yeah, absolutely fascinating to, to see how quickly the body can start to, um, recover when, once you give it the right tools to do so. Um, I've been burning to ask you this question. Uh, I'm, I follow Chris Master John quite closely. I'm not sure if you're aware that um he's been speaking about your work um so i'm going to i'm going to quote him uh he's come up with this hypothesis that we are able to detoxify oxalate um and turn it into co2 and formate basically you know two just just two co2 molecules and he says quote oxalate is in any diet on earth at tens or 100s or hundreds of milligrams per day has toxic effects at physiological concentrations, and we are supposed to uh, not be able to split it into two molecules of CO2 and breathe it out. Um, his hypothesis is essentially, you know, you write about the enzyme pyruvate carboxylase, the biotin-dependent de enzyme um, that oxalate uh, disturbs or inhibits. Um, that operating backwards can, he hypothesizes, can detoxify oxalate. Um, his reasoning sounds quite plausible to me, um, and in a state of biotin deficiency, um, might, uh, inhibit the process of detoxifying oxalate. You mentioned in the book that biotin does seem to help with clearance, uh, and it's one of the nutrients that you, um, put a little bit more emphasis on. I was wondering if you'd heard of, uh, his hypothesis and what you, what you think of that possibility that we are able to detoxify it to some degree? Well, I have spent years rooting around in the literature and a lot of this, that level of um, hypothesis and investigation was going on in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and so on. It got kind of eliminated as we started making science more mercenary, where your science has to lead to a product yep. <laughs> now. So some of the better like basic science stuff was, I think, older, although obviously people still get to do basic science, but it seems to be for our, a different purpose. And mm -hmm. what gets published and gets emphasized and gets funded is more about well, let's fix our problems with products. So I, in reading this older literature from the techniques they had at the time, nobody saw that at all. I didn't find that anywhere. And uh, it, you know, you draw it on paper and it looks like two carbon dioxide molecules, but whether we have any enzymatic powers to do anything about that is unlikely. I mean, we've, everybody's been saying that plants have the degree oxalate degrading enzymes and we don't. And hundreds and hundreds of people have been looking at this over, you know, a hundred years and none of them are in agreement with him. So hats off to Chris for creative thought. I and mean, if he can get funding to have somebody demonstrate, but in the meantime, that's not useful to you and I. It doesn't help us because in reality, eating these foods is causing lots of severe health problems. So you can be newfangled and fancy about thinking about biochemistry, but out here in the real world, we need to know what to eat. And what we need to eat is not these trendy foods with the spinach and everything and the almonds and everything and the gluten-free buckwheat. And the real message is, what can you eat to have a prayer of having a decent life? And what should you let your children eat? And what should you raise them on? Th these are really critical questions, more important than ideas about what's going on in the, the biochemistry in bodies. We, we cannot pretend that that matters more than getting the message out about buckwheat not being a good thing to give your kid. Like, I really want this to be basic 
for the consumer. People need to know what to eat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think you've done such a great job with the book, um, basically just outlining, you know, here's, here's the deal. Um, and I, I guess I wanted to ask also, you you have um, lots of charts uh, outlining, you know, roughly how much oxalate per serving and, and um, you know, per 100 uh, grams and, and those kind of measurements. How much um, research has been done into looking at oxalate concentrations? I imagine there's some variance, you know, between, you know, where they're grown or what, what variety the plants are. Is, is there still room for more improvement and more knowledge about what, what concentrations of oxalates are in different plant foods? There's a barn door of room. We really need to understand food more, but at the same time, we know enough about what the worst offenders are yeah. and, and generally that if you just know all that information, that's really enough to protect you in your health to just not make those food staples. So that's really the key message is those of us who are in the nitty gritty of trying to recover from this damage would like to have fine tuned information. And so thank you to, again, Joanne Yan, who founded the Volver Pain Foundation 30 years ago. She realized within five or six years of starting that we didn't have enough data and we didn't have good reliable data and it wasn't publicly available. So she made fi financing and getting stuff tested, food tested on behalf of her membership was a critical mission. So she's the one who's led the charge at getting foods tested in a way that's consumer friendly and consumer available. So she's been working with a guy named Michael Liebman for a long time. He's retired now. He's doing testing for her and the trying low oxalate group still. Uh, so we've got some data from that. There's also, I've found maybe 250 publications of reporting oxalate testing in the medical literature and have assembled this data. And we can do a lot with that, but it would be really nice in understanding plants and biology to fund some botanists and fund some nutritional scientists and get make this a cool profession. No one's really been able to build a career on telling us like how diverse are apples and tomatoes in terms of their oxalate content. Yep. There's at least 250 commercial varieties of apples. Mm -hmm. We'd want to test all those varieties over multiple years to see if the seasonal changes from year to year, like weather changes from year to year, different soil types, different areas of the world grown. Does that affect their oxalate content? That would be fascinating. It's right up there with Chris and his dicarboxide version. You know, it's a dicarboxyl molecule. Therefore it's two carbon dioxides. It's kind of a little bit geeky to want that information. It's like, this is such an exciting, sexy topic that you want that information. But truth is from how we live, we need a, a simpler understanding of the food. I would really like to be rich enough to found a multi-million dollar research agency that looks into oxalate in foods and does a better job at um, pathology of tissue specimens and makes that more of a thing in, in clinical work as well to be able to evaluate how oxalate is affecting tissues and so on. We need to do that. And hopefully as people wake up to their individual stories of in our own lives, we're being affected by this and that becomes more widely accepted. There'll be more room for financing these kinds of, um, this kind of information. Cause truly some foods are very diverse. The strawberry is a great example of this where some numbers suggest that a strawberry has 24 milligrams of oxalate, which is a lot. Mm -hmm. And some suggest it has one or two. That's too big a range to be a comfortable food. And so the question is, is that the tests that say it's high, are they error? Was that a year where the strawberries were all full of fungus? Because the plants will make more oxalate when they're challenged with fungus. One of the, yeah. one of the roles of oxalate is that plants can convert it into hydrogen peroxide and therefore fight funguses. So a lot of leaves, you know, it's amazing here in the humid summers that we have here, how few leaves get covered in funguses. And that's because plants have these ways to kill fungus and oxalate is a big one. So it'd be nice to know, is it 
is strawberries diverse in their oxalate content because they grow low to the ground and lay on the soil. The soil is full of funguses. And when the weather is damp and wet, which in the spring it usually is when the strawberries are an early spring crop sitting on moldy ground, they're constantly challenged with mold pressure. So therefore they're gonna produce more oxalate when it's wet and moldy versus a dry situation or a different situation where they don't have as much fungal attacking. They may be lower in oxalate, but maybe it's just the variety. We've probably developed, I don't know how many strawberry varieties there are. I could imagine there's 25 easily mm -hmm. varieties of strawberries that humans develop because we've taken great interest in strawberries for a long time and played with that plant. So is the difference, the species, the growing conditions? I say it's all of it. Yep. Um, even the soil composition, I think I mentioned this in the book, with tomatoes, if they're grown in high calcium soils, high calcium soil will promote high oxalate in the plants because the plants get sort of calcium toxic and the way they remove calcium is they turn into calcium oxalate crystals. So tomatoes will get these uh, crystals forming under the skin of the tomato, especially up near the the stem end at the top, like they call the shoulders of the tomatoes, get this gold dust that's calcium oxalate crystals forming in the tissues because the weather has been humid and the soil is high in calcium. Wow, that's fascinating. I, I used to volunteer on a farm and I, I know exactly the, the dust you're talking about. It's, I think those of us in the field of nutrition need to understand agriculture better and work with growing food, maybe do a summer on a farm. Maybe that should be a required summer internship and a nutrition degree is go spend some time on a farm. Because mm. at Cornell, I was on what's called the Ag Quad at Cornell. Right across the quad from my main building with nutrition was the agricultural school. And we never crossed the quad except for microbiology class. Other than that, we didn't study plants and agriculture and weren't taught anything about it. We yeah, also I, weren't taught anything about plant compounds and how to deal with them in the kitchen, like lectins. We weren't taught anything about lectins, like beans should always be soaked and pressure cooked. Like no one told us that in food mm -hmm. class. You get, I think it's seven credits of uh, college credits in food science and no one tells you about lectins. Yeah, I, I went through exactly the same thing. No, no, no speak about lectins, phytates, oxalates, um, which is, you know, it should be semester one, uh, you know, introduction to nutrition type type thing. Yeah. What are we eating? Like, shouldn't we be curious about what we're eating? Mm. Literally the foods and where it comes from and how we produce it. None of that's part of the field. Yeah. Even though it's a home ec kind of, as I explained in the book, Nutrition is less of a medical field, even though originally concern about food was a medical thing. Yeah. But then when it got sort of professionalized, it got professionalized as sort of a home ec thing, which is why it's the College of Human Ecology at Cornell that houses the nutrition department. Right. Well, that's fascinating. Um, I know you have clients coming up, so I won't take too much more of your time. We've already gone through quite a bit, and um, I've learned um, I've learned even more than uh, today than just reading your book. Um, so you've got a big picture of the book behind you. Uh, the book's called Toxic Superfoods. Um, I think it should be required reading for anyone who's interested in um, what they're eating for their health. Uh, really, like you said, it's a missing piece to the puzzle. I think, and um, it pains me to think how many people might benefit from from this information. So uh, thank you for carrying the torch. Uh, I hope more people start to understand that um, these foods should not be staples um, in any sense of the, the term. So thank you for doing what you're doing. I really appreciate uh, you giving me some time. Well, thank you so much for reading the book and sharing it with your listeners. It's We need creative thinking, exploring brains to become open to this it's a great way to help many people easily and it's in the long run yeah to feel great because you quite quit your sweet potato thing it's so easy yeah yeah so yeah. um thank you so much um we'll keep in touch i'll talk to you later looking forward to that Thank you so much for listening. I really hope you enjoyed this one. If you'd like to support Sally, I've left links to her new book, Toxic Superfoods, and her website in the description. 
Sally would also wholeheartedly appreciate if you could leave a nice review of her book wherever you buy it, particularly if her work has benefited you in some way. Sally has invested thousands of dollars and hours into writing this book and it means a lot to her if you can help her get more eyes on her work. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can subscribe so you get notified whenever I release a new episode. I'd also like to encourage you to leave a five-star review or give a thumbs up if you liked the episode. This is a simple no-cost way of supporting my work and helping me reach more listeners. Please feel free to leave comments on my YouTube channel as I do try and read through and respond to as many as I can. I've put links to all my social media platforms in the episode notes if you'd like updates about the podcast, information about health, or if you'd just like to reach out to me. Thanks again for listening, everyone. Take care.